Welcome to the American Planning Association podcast. This episode is part of our series on planning the autonomous future, which looks at the many ways in which autonomous technology will impact our cities and regions, mobility, and the planning profession. I'm your host, Jennifer Hennigan, Deputy Research Director and Manager of the Green Community Center at the American Planning Association. With me today is my co-host, Kelly Coiner. Kelly is the founder and CEO of Mobility E3, and she also serves as a senior fellow at the Center for Regional Analysis and Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. So I'm really psyched to have Corey Clothier here with us today on our podcast. Um, he's also my business partner along with Matt Lesh. And Corey, you know, I find that every time we talk, I learn something new <laughs> about you. So maybe you could just introduce yourself. Sure, sure. My name is Corey Clothier, as you just said. Um, I've been in the autonomous vehicle world since about 2009 as a strategic advisor, looking more at the business side of things. So one of the things that I think I have the claim to is the first automated vehicle pilot in the U.S. And it was actually at Fort Bragg um, at a hospital campus. So did it have a name? Oh, yeah. Our, our program is called <laughs> Arebo, which stood for Applied Robotics for Installation and Base Operations because every Department of Defense project has to have a good acronym. So <laughs> that was ours. Yeah, I seem to remember that it had a little catchier name as well. Who who was the shuttle for? Oh, right. Yes, this is for the Wounded Warriors. So the hospital campus at Fort Bragg was the largest hospital campus, uh, military hospital campus in the U.S. And they actually had a, um, the nickname was a Wounded Warrior campus right next door. And the shuttle, there was autonomous shuttles that were able to take the soldiers and Marines from their barracks to the hospital. That's fascinating because when I've heard about automated technology in the military, I immediately think about aerial drones and that sort of thing, but I didn't realize that there are already pilots moving people around. Yes, the, the program that we were working on, the Arebo project, our goal was tech transition. So we really were looking at commercial applications that we could test out and prove out in the military first that would also have commercial applications for communities and cities. What was the biggest challenge you had in setting up the pilot? Education, really. It was The technology was available. It was ready. We actually brought over the first commercially available autonomous shuttle to the U.S. in 2013. So the military, U.S. military, actually brought the shuttle over from France, a company called Induct that was the predecessor to the company Navia that's out on the streets now. But having to educate the transportation planners um, on the military basis that this was actually in the realm of the possible was step one. So how'd you do it? We had a lot of meetings <laughs> and, uh, and just sharing with them what the technology could do, but then working through a proper planning process to understand the real feasibility. You know, we had to find the problem first. What problems could we solve with this technology? So that was the starting point. So what was the problem you were solving? The problem it was, was really interesting because we had to figure out the business case for each application that we looked at, just like any other commercial launch, is that what what was really the trigger, the business trigger, the economic trigger for this? And what we found at the hospital campus was the soldiers and Marines were missing appointments because they didn't have adequate transportation. And the idea was... We could solve it with this autonomous shuttle because we could essentially go direct. We could provide direct transportation, which the conventional shuttle wasn't able to do. And they just weren't riding the traditional shuttle bus. And so you say direct, that's door-to-door -door service? Yes, yes. So that was the key. And if we could reduce the number of missed appointments, one, the, the people would get the proper treatment that they needed. Um, and the other is that there would be the economic benefit of not wasting the time of the medical experts and the medical staff. Was the vehicles accessible? I'm thinking Wounded Warriors probably needed accessible vehicles. They were. We worked with a great company called Robotics Research that integrated wheelchair ramps and other accessible devices. Um, I think mainly what we really were able to do is the wheelchair ramp. What we explored was kind of the full spectrum of universal design because we knew people were going to have sight issues, hearing issues, cognitive issues. One thing that I learned throughout this process was doing the, the studies and the feasibility study is 
understanding that somebody might get on this with a cognitive issue, get on a vehicle, and not know why they got on the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so how, how could we help that? And then that, that kind of led to further research that we were doing at Local Motors. And, this is, this is great because that's one of the key issues that we've been thinking about here within the planning community on autonomous vehicles are what are the impacts going to be to people who have some sort of disability, be that you know, a physical or cognitive issue that prevents them from getting around. And you started right off the bat in your project with, with addressing that population. Uh, were there any major hiccups or concern, things that you learned through that implementation? No major hiccups. Um, the concerns are there every day. I mean, the safety of, of the riders, obviously, both pedestrians as well as, as the people getting on and off the vehicles. I mean, those are have to be managed. Um, and then just, you know, operating these vehicles safely in a mixed-use environment, that we didn't have dedicated streets. We did it in mixed traffic right from the beginning. And, you know, so just safety is obviously the concern always. But that's a great stepping off point to talk about pilots that are going on in cities and communities. Are you working on any of those? Um, Las Vegas is currently underway. So I helped initiate the Las Vegas pilot. That's that's currently downtown. AAA is a sponsor. Fantastic group. Um, they actually have an autonomous vehicle group at AAA in Northern California who are the sponsors. And in partnership with the city and Keolis and Navia. So... There haven't been very many of these. How many have there been? Oh, real pilots with real ridership. Um, really, Vegas is the first one that's on public streets that's open to the public. You know, there's some that have, have been short-term. May Mobility did a really interesting short pilot in Detroit. That was fantastic. I wrote on that a couple months ago. Um, there's been a lot of demonstrations. Transdev, Keolis have been kind of touring the country, doing demonstrations. Other companies have kind of been doing the same thing. Are there chances for cities to do pilots now? Oh, yes. I think the process of, I'm a big believer in that, in that process, is you, you need to demonstrate. You need to kind of show the realm of the possible to the planners and, and um, to the city leadership. And then I think you need a trial, which could be a pilot, is to really understand how this could work in the current application and also validate safety. And, and operational efficiency. So that's a great thing for a pilot. And then tune and tweak as you go through the stages of the pilot to eventual full deployment, and then hopefully it scales from there. So there are cities right now that are approaching you saying that they're, okay, we're ready, we're thinking about autonomous vehicles, where do we start? Exactly, yeah. And that's, I think, what we're pretty good at is that uh, we definitely have the most experience of collective experience of defining these pilots, what the real use case is, what the business case looks like, and then doing a proper feasibility study through an operational plan. What cities are looking at AV pilot projects right now? Well, we've collected, it's around 40, I think, that I've seen. 40, wow. Yeah, yeah. so I'll list a, off the top of my head a few of them. One that's coming online pretty quickly is actually in testing now is Greenville, South Carolina. Fantastic application. It was actually... That I was talking about the tech transfer from the Rebo project from the military. That's actually the first application. We took the the vehicles from Fort Bragg because they weren't needed anymore, which is great because the Wounded Warrior campus just didn't have that many Wounded Warriors anymore, which is what we're Good all news. excited about. Yeah, and they put it in Greenville, but they had a lot of help. So Federal Highway provided some grant funds. So that's always really important as a way to find the money. Um, an organization called the GAVP. Global Automated Vehicle Partnership also is providing matching funds. And then other cities, uh, Tampa has made a commitment to an autonomous shuttle system. I heard recently Miami is doing it, uh, Detroit, obviously Columbus, Ohio, with their uh, Smart Cities grant, San Francisco, uh, Houston, Dallas. Um, I already mentioned Las Vegas, uh, Denver, Seattle, Portland. So I could just keep going. But, yeah, there's... There's a lot of cities that are exploring it. Well, it's exciting. These things are going to be everywhere. Yeah. What's the first thing a city should do once they've decided they want to do a pilot? But that's a big question. All right, I'll question. break it down. So, like, I think it's a great idea to have a pilot um, that connects the parking lot to a stadium. Um, is that the best pilot for me? And how do I figure out if there's something better? So to actually get started, to understand whether or not your community or your city 
is, is right for a pilot, if, if it's the right time, if it's the right application for a pilot. And the first thing we have to understand is what problem you're trying to solve or what opportunity you're trying to meet with this technology. And the way to do that, first of all, we have to meet with everybody, meet with all the stakeholders within the community or the city and understand what you know just all of those details of what's the infrastructure look like what's the traffic situation how many people or uh, you know, how many people are you trying to move you know uh, items like that and, and just do a proper feasibility study to make sure that it's it's um, even makes sense it sounds very similar to the process that you'd go through if you were planning a new transit line or bus route or something like that yes i, I I'm sure it is, and hopefully it's a little simpler because we're talking mostly first and last mile mm -hmm. um, applications right now with fairly low volume of vehicles to start through the trial and pilot setting. So if we're focused on first the feasibility of a pilot, it should be pretty simple and pretty quick. It's a lot smaller scale, I think, than what the transportation community is used to. Sure. Everyone wants to know, like, do I need to invest in infrastructure before I do a pilot? It's a great question, and we get that question all the time, and it, I don't have a great answer. Um, I don't know. We don't know until we see what the application looks like. Generally, the autonomous vehicle companies are trying to build their systems to work within the existing infrastructure. So even if there are some investments that are needed, they probably will be small. So I don't have to upgrade to 5G in order to have an autonomous vehicle shuttle pilot. Nope, don't, probably don't have to upgrade any wireless strategies, although some type of connected vehicle strategy is probably going to be warranted and necessary. We'll, we'll see. You know, it depends on what you already have, what the city already has, what the chosen supplier also has. There's no menu. It, you know, you can't just say, this is the system that will work for your city. We really, yes. They're all going to be customized to, you know, the need right now. So, to get a little deeper into the technology, um, since many of our listeners may not be all that familiar with the terminology, what exactly is a connected vehicle system? What are we talking about with that? And the kind of the simplest terms is just wireless communication between vehicles, the vehicles themselves. So that's a vehicle to vehicle. And then in a vehicle to infrastructure scenario, let's say the traffic light is communicating with the vehicle. It's fairly simple. It's just telling it, I'm green, I'm red, I'm yellow. And then the autonomous system can then react accordingly. Okay, so this might be something similar to what many communities may have with their emergency vehicles. Yeah, very, very similar. And it's also very, there's no clear standard yet. So it's very flexible still. And different companies are using different technologies for that communication. So can I go on the internet or go to a parking lot and pick out an autonomous vehicle or <laughs> what's available and how do I figure out what's going to meet the needs in my city? Some people are, uh, are trying to do that. Some people are trying to say, act like they're buying a bus or buying a car and then they think that it can just be installed and that's not the case. So there are great companies out there globally working on this technology. Just in the U.S., in the low-speed side, there are probably a solid dozen companies working on low-speed autonomous or automated mobility solutions. But you can't, none of them are an off-the-shelf strategy or solution. Every one of them has to be kind of tested and fit to the application. You know, they're set up and testing and it could take weeks, it could take months to actually dial the system in to the, to the city's needs. So, you know, everybody talks about an AV shuttle and thinks it's nobody's on it operating it. Is that true? It's half true. Um, some of the current pilots that are going on, there is somebody on it as an operator, but they're not really operating it. They're just providing oversight. Essentially, they're the human emergency in the loop. So they have their hand on the, the big red button or near the big red button, or they have some kind of a remote control device to be able to do an emergency stop or to take over manual control if necessary. So they're called operators or they're called concierge, but they're really there just as that emergency backup. But pretty soon, they'll be off. That's the goal. And different cities and states have different tolerance levels for not having a human on board. But there's some new technology that's coming out, or I should say there's some new vehicles coming out. Like there's, there's a really interesting RoboMart. I don't know if you guys have seen that. So we're not talking about moving people, 
but it's moving groceries and they will not have a human on board when they launch later this year. Is the need for having a human on board at this point um, really necessary for the op- potential operation of the vehicle, or is it more to get people comfortable with the idea of there not being someone sitting behind the wheel driving? The idea of an operator on board is different. It's mainly its comfort level of the insurance company or of the transportation leader of that city who's providing oversight or you know, essentially is the sponsor. Uh, it may also be some of the autonomous vehicle suppliers feel more comfortable with an operator on board for a certain amount of time while it's being run through its paces and it's doing its testing and trial phase. Um, I haven't seen it that much for the riders. You know, I don't know how many demos I've done, dozens and dozens. And most people will ask a few questions, like, you know, the general questions, how does this know where it's going? How does it know where it is? Why won't it crash into anything? And they answer, you know, they get answers to their two or three questions and they go back to looking at their phone. So I've found that most people are pretty comfortable pretty quickly. Even even to the point we were doing a demonstration in Florida and a family got on and I was so excited to share this with them and said, what do you think? You're riding in a robot vehicle. And and the dad looked around and said, we are? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, there's no controls. There's no steering wheel. And he looked around and he goes, oh, you're right. Hey, kids, what do you think? Look, we're, this, this is a robot. They just didn't care. They just wanted to get from point A to point B. And if the thing did it in a boring way, if I didn't bring it up, they probably they would have never even known. So I don't think consumer acceptance is really that big of a deal, especially when we're talking about transit vehicles in the low speed arena. What do you mean um, by by low speed? In the low speed category, as we were defining it, it was essentially 25 miles or less. So the NEV category for DOT. NEV? NEV, I'm sorry, Neighborhood Electric Vehicle category. Okay. Um, so limiting the speed to 25 miles an hour, we you know get to claim uh, NEV status for certification. So that was one of our goals early on. But really what it is, as I was doing my research when I was with the military on autonomous vehicles, is that we found that they had pretty much the same problems that cities did. And we were trying to solve those problems with autonomous vehicles. And one of the big ones was congestion and first and last mile transit. So those two problems, as we did the research and we started to learn more, because we were, we were a bunch of vehicle people. We weren't really transit people and transportation people, is that we found that we could solve those problems with low speed applications. And to us, that low speed limit was about 25 miles per hour, which also was congruent with the, you know, the NEV rating. So that's where we st- stayed. Is that NEV rating important in terms of getting your pilot project certified? How, why, why does that matter? Well, one big one for NEVs is it doesn't require crash testing of the vehicles. So if you stay below 25 miles per hour, then that's a, you, you're taking one of the big challenges away. Even when we're certifying these low-speed shuttles for service on public streets, they don't really actually fit fully into the NEV class, so that we have to get exemptions from NHTSA. And mainly it's around um, the weight restrictions. Mm. So it's, it's really interesting because it's a gray area. Is it a bus or is it an NEV? And NHTSA is helping us with waivers and exemptions to be able to safely operate these on the roads. It's funny to me to be talking about doing pilot projects in communities when it sounds as though the entire industry is in this pilot project phase and has been for a year for a few years now. Well, the whole thing is moving really fast and yeah. trying to figure out uh, what directions and what things you know meet needs first. Um, sometimes we get tripped up on language about things. So certification in the technology sense really refers to what is the certification for safety purposes from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. But pilots are not actually certified. And communities really need help on figuring out, you know, how to how they manage a project and how they manage a pilot and how they move forward. If there is a city out there that is looking to start planning for autonomous vehicles, what is the playbook they need to be following? What do they need to be thinking about right now? 
So they need um, to be doing the feasibility study that Corey talked about. They need to be putting together the operations plan, the safety plan, um, how they're going to verify that uh, the vehicles are going to work. They need to be putting together procurement. Um, And these things are not hard, but there's not a playbook for it yet that would really help cities or a region work through this. And so my sort of call to action to our listeners is to help us think about how we get that playbook written. So the best playbook is put together by combining technical insight and experience that people like Corey has with the um, joining it with the needs of cities and, and states and the and the users who are going to use this, not just the people who are operating the system, but the consumers um, who are going to ride on it. And, you know, and as you we mentioned stakeholders before when we're talking about a pilot, this kind of goes broader, and we're talking about the stakeholders, national stakeholders, mm-hmm. because there's some great work being done. There's great best practices that are being established, and we need to gather all of those and, and put them in the playbook. Yep. Corey, thank you for joining us to talk about autonomous vehicles. Um, now, there's one thing that I've been thinking about with in terms of autonomous vehicles. From the consumer perspective, I usually think of something like a Tesla, you know, a, a private passenger vehicle. But when you talk about AV mobility systems, that's not what you're talking about. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the design of the vehicles? What do they look like? Sure. You know, that's at least not what I'm talking about, is the conversion of passenger vehicles. That's just, that's a path. The automakers are already on that path, and they're going to do an amazing job. But when we're really talking about automated mobility or automated transit, it's something different. And what we're talking about, for me, I believe in purpose-built autonomous vehicles. So, you know, I give the example sometimes of watching the movie WALL-E. As if anybody's familiar with that, there's a hundred different little robots that do unique jobs. And I think that's really the future of transportation for us because that makes sense when you're thinking about technology and automation and robotics is that you don't need a Swiss Army knife just, you know, to cut an apple. So, you know, something simple to do the job. So what was the vehicle um, in the pilot that you worked on in Fort Bragg? What what was that like? It's about as simple as you can get. It was a golf cart. Oh. Yeah. So in why it was a golf cart is because there wasn't a U.S.-made autonomous vehicle in the market yet. So there was one company in France that had a little shuttle bus, but it just wasn't here in the U.S. yet. So this fantastic company, Robotics Research, they automated, they converted a golf cart, and they put in um, they put in an ADA compliant wheelchair ramp, and they made one of the f- first autonomous vehicles in the U.S. that was available for everyday use. Wow, I would not have guessed a golf cart. Yeah, it's not very sexy, but it does the job. Um, obviously, we've we've moved beyond golf carts in the past few years. What sort of vehicles are available? right now what are what are uh, companies coming out with maybe we've moved past golf carts so i like to say talk about you know if a golf cart can do the job and it's the best it's the best tool for the job then let's use it you know we're seeing a lot of polaris gems out on the streets may mobility is using polaris gems optimus ride also so it's a good vehicle it's a nice little electric vehicle and kind of moving through the spectrum from simple to more sophisticated, a little more elegant, is you start to see these autonomous shuttles, like Navia has a, a nice shuttle, Easy Mile has the Easy 10, um, company Coast is coming out with one, Local Motors Ollie. I know of a couple others that are being built kind of on the side. Um, Transdev is actually building the Crystal. It's another like 12 passenger, 16 passenger shuttle. So the shuttles are, are becoming pretty common. In, so in this market? When we talk about shuttles, is that like an 8 to 16 passenger yeah, range? Yeah, exactly. And most of them look like a box <laughs> or a toaster. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's some a little bit different styling. Some, some are really unique in that they don't really look like they have a front or back, which I really like because 
these vehicles could essentially be bi-directional. They don't really have to have a front or back. They can, you know, they're kind of like a horizontal elevator. They, they just huh. move on the street that way. How many vehicles were there in the Fort Bragg? I think they only had a couple. They did a couple golf carts, and then I think they did a passenger van that they um, put in a an automated um, wheelchair ramp. What I mean automated, meaning it didn't need human assist. So do people just use one kind of vehicle in these projects? or No, you know, that's not something that is part of the planning process. Is it, I think it's really important to look at the application and see what makes sense. We did a, a little feasibility study for a company that I know they... They're not, we're not allowed to say their name for another three years, but Silicon Valley company that was really interesting. And we were looking at two different vehicles for their application. One, the kind of that shuttle, the, you know, 12 passenger shuttle, but then also they wanted kind of express service. So mm-hmm. we were looking at more like a two seater, like a pod car, almost like um, the Waymo vehicle, the, the little um, Firefly that Waymo did. So, you know, Corey, we have a, a new client that uh, is interested in having a sort of a fully autonomous shuttle fleet um, on, you know, on its campus to mix with uh, bikes and pedestrian traffic. And I thought it was really interesting when we were talking about it that, you know, we were trying to figure out sort of what would meet their maximum need. And you said, maybe that's not the right way to look at it. We might look at different kinds of vehicles. And so, you know, I can think about, well, we started with a golf cart, and then we talked about a shuttle. But what other kinds of vehicles, and can you do a mix of vehicles in a fleet? You know, I think a mix is, is almost necessary because, I mean, we just look at our everyday transportation, and it's a mix. It's trains and buses and shuttles and cars of all different sizes and bicycles. And so I don't think that's going away. Um, I think that we have to find the right fleet mix for the application. It's a challenge right now because there just aren't that many. So I, I listed some that are working on shuttles. Um, another company that's getting ready to launch a deployment in Houston is to get there. You know them really well, Kelly, is uh, coming out of Europe. And they have two different concepts. One is a PRT. Uh, I think it's about four to six passenger. What does PRT mean? Mm-hmm. Personal rapid transit. Another nickname is a pod car because it kind of looks like a pod. And then they have a bigger version called uh, GRT, a group rapid transit. And I think that that capacity is around 20 for that vehicle. Um, I could be wrong, but really interesting, very high-tech, futuristic-looking vehicle. So. so if you were just going to, you know, pull out a designer pin and think about what the the next set of, you know, oh, this is all changing and it's sort of the future is ours to create, what would be the what would be the missing vehicles in uh, in the mix and the prospects for developing them for uh, deployment soon? Yeah, I always, <laughs> I love that designer hat. So we, we're seeing a little bit of activity in the larger size vehicles. So going from the 12 passenger, 16 passenger up to the 20, 25 passenger. So there'll be some volume there. Um, actually, we were even seeing a project with a full size bus, um, a fully automated full size bus. But me, I get excited about the smaller vehicles because I'm a big believer in kind of that just in time theory is that we move more people in smaller bunches more frequently rather than putting them all in a mass on a big bus. I mean, you, know, you have to do that for buses and trains when there's high volume. Uh, absolutely, it makes sense. But just for the day-to-day on-demand needs, a lot of small vehicles will do the job um, a lot more efficiently. That's really interesting to me, the way that you explained why you would have different types of vehicles in a fleet. Um, because it made a lot of sense to me as a commuter, I use four different modes of transportation to get to work every morning. Uh, so that does make a lot of sense. But does it make it more complicated on the implementation end to try to deal with different types and sizes of vehicles? You know, honestly, I have to say probably. Right, so let's go with a yes in the short term. But it's our future. So we might as well start working on it now. And that's just the, you know, the way you just described it is perfect. It, not every vehicle will fit the, that application. You know, if you are on a commute that's 50 miles, you're still going to have to take multiple modes of transportation. And, and then also if you're traveling alone or with a party, then, or if you have some type of mobility issues. So those different vehicles are going to be necessary in the fleets. No, it's just really exciting to think about uh, that there 
all these vehicles, some of them were really cute names and ones that we haven't <laughs> even thought about. Oh, by the way, those are names like um, the Ollie and Milo for Easy Mile. Um, I know the cute names don't really do it for you, Corey. So what, what are you working <laughs> on that really gets you excited? Well, I wouldn't assume that cute names don't work for me because I led the development of Ollie at Local Motors. And I thought that name was awesome. It's it was, a very it's adorable. cute name. Got to give a shout out to my man, Cody Sellers, who came up with that. He was our product marketing manager at the time. So, you know, just staying on Ollie, I'm excited about Ollie. It's it's a fantastic vehicle. We really worked hard to make it um, make it a vehicle that would really speak to the riders, you know, to really fit within the community. And we did that through a partnership with IBM. And, you know, we had some really interesting, innovative concepts that we were working on of how to really interact with the vehicle and especially when we're talking about different accessibility challenges of being able to get on the vehicle and talk to it and ask it questions and you know have that kind of you know feeling that you're with a human maybe if that makes sense is to be able to say you know ollie where are we going or um ollie how do you know not to run into that car in front of us and actually have the the artificial intelligence from Watson, from IBM's Watson, be able to answer and have a natural conversation. That was pretty exciting. And then they've taken it to the next level and they just launched uh, Accessible Ollie at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas a few weeks ago. And that's all groundbreaking stuff. So then, and, and then I just get excited about cool vehicles. I mean, I think what Ultra PRT is doing is really futuristic and forward thinking. And I know there's a few other companies. Um, you guys have a company here locally in the Chicago area called Innova EV that has kind of like a little pod car, a little two-seat electric vehicle that they are converting to autonomous. So, oh, wow. What is it that Ultra PRT is doing that's, that's, that's so cool? I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar with that company. You know, one is that they have a real system. They've been, they've been operating a public-use autonomous system for years now in the Mazdar city in in the Middle East. But they just have a lot of experience. So one, their system works. So that alone is exciting. But just, just the vehicle design itself, this kind of futuristic pod-looking uh, vehicle, it, it's just cool. And they're not done knowing that they just came out with a new vehicle and they're starting North American manufacturing this year. It's, it's exciting. That's, that's very heartening to hear for me because I... I like cars. I've always liked cars. And so many of these autonomous concepts I've seen have, um, as you've described, they look like a box. There's not a whole lot interesting there visually to look at. So there are companies out there who are trying to do something more on the design end. Yeah, that's, I totally forgot there about this company. I met with them also at CES, um, a company called Ankita. They're making a brand new autonomous vehicle, and they it's the same thing. They don't want to make a box. So they're doing something really unique. They're working with a great company out of Italy for the actual vehicle design. Nice. So we've talked a lot about shuttles and sort of traditional looking types of vehicles, but what other options are there um, in terms of autonomous vehicles? What are people working on that's a little different or maybe a little more exciting? Yeah. You know, we can be so much more creative as we start to head down this path towards fully automated vehicle systems, especially when we stay in the low speed side, you know, we don't have to have the same kind of vehicle uh, structure that has to withstand a crash at 60 or 70 miles per hour. So we can get a lot more creative when we are moving at 15 miles per hour, 25 miles per hour. So some of the things that we're seeing, I I just posted something, Kelly reminded me that um, an autonomous wheelchair so, I mean, that's the ultimate personal mobility is just a single seat automated vehicle that's on the horizon. I know multiple companies that are working on that now. Um, and then if we kind of scale up from there, I've seen larger versions of, of that, um, you know, two seaters, four seaters, some that are open air, some that are fully enclosed like a bubble. Uh, you can start to use different materials that's one thing that we were working on at local motors was a 3d printed vehicle so we actually had a a 3d printed vehicle the full chassis and body all kind of one piece and you can get really interesting and creative with that and and you know we're just scratching the surface on 3d printing 
you know, the next 20 years is going to be fascinating what we're able to accomplish with that. But I think the main point is that we can really be a lot more innovative and we can we can build design for the job. So, you know, kind of a job's to be done, but with the rider in mind. And I think that's the key is that let's build the right tool. So thinking about creative vehicle design, um, tell us about the Atticus. What, what is that? That is something completely different. So when we talk, that's a paradigm shift for sure, which is exciting. So the short story is there is a gentleman in Florida. He's a brilliant mechanical engineer, and he owns a company called Cat Trek, which is a recumbent three-wheeled bicycle. And he, you know, as a hobby, he decided he wanted to get into um, autonomous vehicles. So he built one in his garage. But it's not your general hobbyist. I mean, this this guy is really talented. And he came up with a completely new idea for what this vehicle could be like. And he was telling me that he thought about it like a bike, like the frame should last a lifetime. But the components are modular and should be able to be upgraded. So he built a really interesting frame, essentially out of extruded aluminum, um, channel aluminum, things that you could really bolt on really easily. And it's a fully electric vehicle. He put in a drive-by-wire system, which essentially drive-by-wire means you be you can steer, brake, accelerate just through you know wire interface, you know electronic interface, and that's essential for autonomous vehicles. And you know he asked advice from a lot of the best companies out there that are currently making autonomous vehicles. But this vehicle, you know, it looks like an erector set. <laughs> and his point is, why not? You know, if if we're only moving at 12 miles per hour, and this is a first and last mile vehicle, and you can reconfigure the seating, and you can do you put all, whatever kind of body you want on it. One of his designs has a translucent body, so you can see everything moving. Super cool. So you know, it, it's really interesting just. When you start to see people that are not auto industry people starting to create these new vehicles. So the thing that really excites me is that we think about how the vehicle can change and and that someone like the inventor or designer of Atticus can do this sort of in the equivalent of their garage. And that would sort of have the same kind of challenge at the community level when you're talking about a planner thinking about how we use autonomous vehicles and what that might look like. And so there's this opportunity to be inventive, you know, be inventive on the bike path, be inventive on a dedicated lane, be inventive along with the people who are doing these vehicles. Because, you know, I have a conversation with some colleagues, with one of our clients that are planners who, you know, sort of jokingly said, um, well, why not an autonomous bike? Which sounded a little ridiculous until I saw Atticus. And I thought, wait a second, that really is kind of an autonomous bike. Um, so I guess the sort of thing I would say is nobody has a lock on uh, what this new paradigm looks like. And planners really can help us define what is the job that the vehicle needs to do to serve people in their communities. Yeah, that, yeah that's a great point. You know, one thing I also want to make I don't want to make light of how much work it takes to get a vehicle to market, though, and, and to for an autonomous vehicle or an electric vehicle to be safe. Even if it's in this, you know, I was talking about some ideas that are seem like they're out there a little bit. So I, I don't want to um, underestimate or lead people down the wrong path to think that you come up with an idea and in six months you have a, ve- a brand new concept of a vehicle or a 3D printed vehicle running on the roads it still is going to take a couple of years to actually do the full engineering and testing and validation of the vehicle. But, you know, there's new exciting things ahead. They, yeah. they will not look like the traditional vehicles of yesterday. Well, and I, I think that's a nice kind of close on this conversation. I and mean, we, we talk about um, trying to figure out what this new thing is. And, you know, when we shifted from horse and carriage, we called the car, the horseless carriage. And when we, you know, we're making this shift, we're really stuck on thinking about it as a driverless car instead of all these kind of rich, different um, ways that we can use autonomy. Um, but at the same time, we learned a lot in the last several decades, and your point's well taken. We need to make sure that they're well constructed um, and that we have confidence in, in the, way that they're, the way they're put together and operated. 
Hey, Jennifer, thanks for letting me have Corey on the show. Of course. Thanks for coming by. It was a great conversation. My pleasure. Thank you very much. It was fun. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the American Planning Association podcast. You can listen to past episodes at planning.org slash podcasts. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Have an idea for a podcast? Email them to podcast at planning.org.